This is a response to answer question 1's video reply to my video, The Arrogance of Creationism. In it, answer questions 1, who shall henceforth be referred to as AQ, pose two questions, one of which has several parts, and they are as follows. 1. Given all the problems with the Big Bang model, is it not appropriate to abandon it? And 2. What would it take to falsify the Big Bang theory? For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to answer your second question first. Falsifying the Big Bang model would require you to point out discrepancies in the predictions made by the Big Bang. Unfortunately for you, however, every prediction made by the Big Bang theory that does not pertain to the distant future has already come to fruition. Hypothetically, though, one could be able to disprove the Big Bang theory. The redshifted galaxies whose electromagnetic frequencies indicate that their recessional velocities are proportional to their distances and hence indicates an expansion of the universe that also conforms to the Hubble constant can be falsified if you only demonstrate that the galaxies do not display redshift or that the rate of recession does not conform to the Hubble constant. Unfortunately for you, however, it does, and it has for the past 80 years. Of course, this just demonstrates that the universe is expanding at a measurable rate, as Einstein's general relativity predicts, and so you could claim that it didn't expand from an initial singular state. You could say that, if you could prove that there is no afterglow of the incredibly hot and dense early universe, as the Big Bang model says there should be. Unfortunately for you, however, we found it. Here it is. You could prove, however, that this isn't the cosmic background radiation if you could demonstrate that its temperature is not more or less 3 Kelvin, as the Big Bang Theory predicts it should be. Unfortunately for you, however, the temperature of the background radiation is a little over 2.7 Kelvin. Then again, you could disprove the Big Bang Theory by pointing out that in such a hot and dense early universe, there must have been a plethora of nuclear reactions occurring, so there should be an overabundance of helium in the universe, yet we don't find any. Oh wait! Yes we do, and the precise amount that would be expected in the aforementioned system no less. To be fair though, in order for the Big Bang Theory to be viable, the universe has to be homogeneous, meaning that the mass energy is relatively evenly distributed throughout the universe, and it has to be isotropic, meaning that at large enough scales, it looks the same wherever you look. By proving that the universe does not or did not meet those conditions, you could disprove the Big Bang Theory. Unfortunately for you, however, the isotropy and homogeneity of the universe has been confirmed to one part in a hundred thousand. You might know a thing or two about nuclear physics though, AQ, so you could disprove the Big Bang by pointing out that the predicted distribution of the elements, with lighter ones being far more common than heavier ones as would be expected from the cooling of such a plasma state, as well as coalescing in perfect harmony with Hubble's law, is not observed. Unfortunately for you, however, it is. One very easy way to disprove the Big Bang Theory is to use spectroscopy or cosmic candles to determine the distance to distant objects, and find at least one whose light has been traveling for a time longer than the age of the universe that the Big Bang Theory predicts. Unfortunately for you, however, the ages of the farthest objects in the universe, like quasars, have never been found to exceed the predicted age of the universe. But let's go back to the single strongest piece of evidence for the Big Bang. It's afterglow. This might look like just a bunch of pretty colors to you, but the astrophysicists who first saw it were reduced to tears from what they discovered. By studying this radiation, you can determine the distribution of mass in the early universe, so if you can find a single discrepancy in it, you can easily destroy the Big Bang Theory. Unfortunately for you, however, the cosmic background radiation shows that the superheated gas that resulted from the recombination epoch following the Big Bang cooled 380,000 years after the initial expansion in harmony with all gas laws and was distributed in accordance with all gravitational predictions that are in accordance with the Big Bang model. Finally, you could look at any of the evidence for the Big Bang that I've just provided, along with the myriads of more evidence that can be found in the literature, and look for a single contradiction between the data. Unfortunately for you, however, that search will be in vain. Are you noticing a pattern, AQ? Now, it would be pretty bad for your creationist position if the Big Bang Theory was just configured into its current form after all of this evidence was discovered. After all, it fits harmoniously with the mathematics and the physics. Imagine, therefore, how much worse it is that these lines of evidence were all predicted before their discoveries. Even Hubble's redshifted galaxies were lurking in Einstein's equation for more than 10 years before they were discovered. The time to disprove the Big Bang Theory has come and gone, AQ. 
Only an extraordinary revelation can change our mind on this matter. If, for instance, you can find a flaw in Hubble's calculations, or perhaps determine that the satellites that measured the background radiation were defective, then maybe you'd have a case. Aside from such extreme scenarios, however, there is nothing you can do to disprove the Big Bang Theory at this point. Of course, you could have figured this all out yourself had you decided to do some actual research on the matter, instead of giving it the lazy and superficial treatment of typing the Big Bang is a lie into the Google machine and swallowing whatever results you got like a horny college freshman. It's this superficiality that positively shone through when you asked the banal question of why I'm so against teaching the controversy about the Big Bang, as though there's an equally valid view that isn't being represented. Why am I against teaching the controversy, you ask? Because there is no controversy. The overwhelming majority of the scientific community accept this theory as being accurate, and the only people who are arguing against it are the politically and religiously motivated pseudo-intellectuals from whom you've lapped up the arguments in your video. That having been said, I'll move on to your first question, in which you asked me why we haven't abandoned the Big Bang Theory if there's so much wrong with it. I'll get to your individual claims with regard to this point in a moment, but first I need to point out that because the Big Bang has been so successful in predicting so many phenomena, it is at worst a very good approximation of how observable reality behaves. Abandoning it is therefore a stupid move, as it's already proven to be an extremely reliable model, so at worst it simply needs revision. This holds true for most theories. If you don't understand why abandoning the Big Bang Theory, even though it has unresolved anomalies, is a stupid move, then perhaps an analogy will help. If your child is sick, you don't need to euthanize her. You can just give her antibiotics. I should also remind you that no theory is flawless, and none of them are complete, and we will get back to this point when I deal with your final contention. Now I know that I'm about to take your arguments out of order, and I do apologize for that, but I want to get the easy stuff out of the way first. So without further ado, here are my refutations to your pontifications. 1. Singularities do not change. Incorrect. Stephen Hawking received his Nobel Prize for discovering that black holes, which contain singularities at their hearts, emit radiation and eventually evaporate. While the primordial singularity fundamentally differs from a black hole for a reason that I'll get to in a moment, we already have precedent to believe that the initial singularity could also fluctuate in behavior. We don't yet know what caused the Big Bang, but all of the evidence, as I've shown earlier in the video, indicates that the Big Bang took place. There is, once again, no controversy over whether it happened. How it happened is a matter open to discussion. 2. Where did all the energy come from? In accordance with the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change states. It is therefore eternal. You seem to think that the origin of energy could only be due to supernatural causes, and to back this up, you cited the second law of thermodynamics. 3. The second law of thermodynamics. You correctly stated that the second law of thermodynamics predicts that after an infinite amount of time, entropy maxes out. You therefore reason that energy cannot be eternal, and must therefore have originated via supernatural means. But how does entropy work in a singularity? Stephen Hawking's research led him to discover that entropy in a black hole is proportional to the area of the event horizon divided by the Planck length squared. By contrast, the primordial singularity contained the entire universe, and therefore had no event horizon, and thus no event horizon area. Plug in the appropriate values, and the value for entropy in the primordial singularity approaches zero. This also explains why the entropy of the universe used to be so low, and defined what can be referred to as the thermodynamic arrow of time. I will also remind you that an infinite amount of time has not passed, as time did not exist prior to the Big Bang. 4. Energy turns into particle-antiparticle pairs, yet there are almost no antiparticles in the universe. Therefore, all of the mass in the universe could not have come from energy. It is very possible that following the period of inflation, which I will get to in a moment, not all particles and antiparticles made contact. Antiparticles could be scattered throughout the universe. After all, traditional baryonic matter comprises only 4% of the known universe. The European Space Agency's integral satellite discovered a huge antimatter cloud near the galactic center, so who's to say that there isn't any more out there? And even if inflation hadn't unevenly separated matter and antimatter, numerous experiments at the Large Hadron Collider have confirmed that oscillating antiparticles can decay into particles, and can do so at a very fast rate, which can help explain the uneven distribution. 
Despite your protestations to the contrary, we have viable models of how energy could have condensed into uneven distributions of matter and antimatter. 5. What was the mechanism that caused the inflationary period, and what slowed it down? You seemed in your video to be laboring under the dreadful misapprehension that space expands as a result of traditional energy, when in reality, it's a homogeneous pressure energy gradient, colloquially referred to as dark energy, that accelerates universal expansion. Not much is known about dark energy at the present time, so I cannot explain to you exactly why inflation behaved as it did. What I can tell you, however, is that we know that it took place because it concurs with an enormous set of observations, explaining how the universe came to be isotropic, homogeneous, and flat. Alternatives to inflation have been proposed, of course, and multiple models have also been considered to try to understand exactly what transpired in that fraction of a second. But let's go back to what I said earlier about us not knowing everything about any theory. I'm sure that you're more than aware that gravitational theory is presently not formally reconciled with quantum mechanics, yet I don't hear you calling for the dismissal of gravity or quantum mechanics. We don't have a full understanding of how leptons interact with quarks, yet I don't hear you calling for the abandonment of atomic theory. Hell, we don't even have a model that allows us to solve arbitrary differential equations. In fact, even our most advanced computer programs can at best only approximate solutions to these equations. Do you propose that we abandon the theory of differential equations, arguably the most important branch of mathematics? It is disingenuous of you in the extreme to demand that we abandon the Big Bang theory over our lack of understanding of a fraction of a second in the history of one of the most well-substantiated theories in science, while simultaneously pontificating on theories that have even larger and arguably more fundamental gaps. It's even more unscrupulous of you because these arguments aren't even yours. They're parroted from creationist websites. You're arguing against the Big Bang not because your arguments have merits, but because you want to defend a biased and demonstrably wrong position, and this is why you're scientifically illiterate. I don't mean to bash on you, AQ. You're a nice guy, but you need to seriously reconsider what you're doing. You need to reassess your priorities and think very carefully about what you're doing. Why not believe in God but still accept that the Big Bang took place? Why not do both? Most Christians already understand that you can't take all of Scripture literally. Why not become one of them? There is no shame in being wrong, AQ, but there is shame in refusing to concede defeat. I don't know whether you've noticed, AQ, but every time creationists attempt to pontificate on science, they only end up embarrassing themselves. Rejecting the Big Bang theory is tantamount to rejecting cell theory. It's embarrassing. You're on the losing side of history and science, AQ, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can concede defeat on this matter and consequently gain the respect of everybody who watches this video. You can still climb out of this hole, AQ. There is no shame in being wrong. Everybody is inevitably wrong about something in their life, and as hard as it can be, you have to be able to live with your mistakes. It is shameful to refuse to yield when you've been proven wrong on a point, and doubly so when your understanding on the topic is limited to what you've read on Answers in Genesis. Post a retraction video as a reply to this one, and you will have earned my respect. You may not have the discipline or drive to work like a scientist, AQ, but at least have the honor and dignity to fail like one.